Join me in prayer. Gracious and eternal Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to do this service. We ask, Lord in heaven, that you be very present with us this morning. Be present as we pray and, and listen to the word and, and endeavor to grow closer to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome to our worship service today. This is not the ideal, of course. The ideal is to be present together in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning, enjoying fellowship and enjoying the presence of God together. But since we cannot do this right now, and understandably so, we need to worship together in this venue. So I invite you to join me as we spend time together in the presence of God. Now because of the fact that everything is closed down uh, for the next few days, uh, that means that our Bible studies and other activities are closed down uh, for the next few days. I will continue to do outlines and possibly do a study such as this uh, online, but our gathering together for worship and for studies uh, will be uh, not happening uh, for the next several days. But I invite you to join me as together we spend time in the presence of God. Join me, if you would, in the call to worship. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I sin, ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light to you. We have gathered together today to worship the Lord. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in and before and behind and lay your hand upon me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. With this in mind, I invite you to join me as together we pray the prayer of confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Lord, we confess to you together our need for you, and as the psalmist has said, sustain in us a willing spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, 
Amen. Let's now spend a moment in silence, in personal confession before our Lord. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to read from the Bible today, let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand the things that we should know from these readings this morning. Let's pray together. Gracious and eternal Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the Bible knowing that it's a book of, of joy and gladness, a book of instruction, a book of help, a book of guidance so that we may live the life that you have called us to live. We pray that you will help us to hear the things that you would say to us today, Lord, through Jesus Christ. Amen. From the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah, he wrote, For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together a great company. They shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young man and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy, I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And from the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, St. Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, 
to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined for us the adoption of as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward the redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now a reading from the gospel, from the gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. This is a very common passage of scripture. I think it's one that people have heard over and over again, and it's one that carries a, a lot of theology in it. I would like for you to listen for the word of the Lord from the Gospel of St. John, chapter one, this morning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light. He came to testify to the light. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him. Yet. The world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed on his name, he gave the power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, filled with grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this is the one of whom I said, the one who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Now this, I know, is a very common passage of scripture. And the title of the sermon today is, quite simply, The Word Became Flesh. And this reading, I believe, is all about the Incarnation. Now, I think what the Gospel writer is trying to say, quite basically, and in very simple terms, is that Jesus is God. And that's the definition of the term incarnation. Now, the writer says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the phrase, the Word, in this reading is commonly believed to refer to Christ. The author is pointing strongly to the belief that Jesus is God. We are in the process of celebrating the 12 days of Christmas. A few days ago we celebrated the, the Nativity which is all about the Incarnation. Oh, by the way, the definition of the word incarnation defined in the Christian context is talking about Christ and that Christ became human. God became human in the person of Christ. The nativity is about the incarnation. God became human in the person of Jesus. God who is God over and above all of time, all of humanity, all of existence. God became human in the person of Jesus. He is the Christ. God became incarnate. God became flesh. The Word became flesh, and in so doing, secured for us right relationship with God, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. Now, the Nativity is all about this incarnation. The readings for the days of the Nativity emphasize the humanness of Christ. Jesus was completely human and bound by the same human characteristics and limitations as all of us. Now, I've said many times, and, and you've heard me say it over and over again, I have said and continue to believe that if Jesus were not completely human, then the incarnation didn't count. The humanness of Jesus cannot be overlooked. The reading from the Gospel of St. John this morning, however, emphasizes the divinity of Christ. If the phrase, the Word, is translated as referring to Christ, then the writer is emphasizing the notion that Christ is God. He is saying that the Word was present with God at the foundation of the world, and that the Word was God. And he also says that the writer, the writer also says that the Word was responsible for the creation of all things that have been created. The Word is the Creator, therefore the Word is God. Therefore, Jesus, who was fully human, was at the same time completely God. The Creator the Creator became part of the creation in order to secure eternal life for the creation and make life better. Now, the Word, or Jesus, the Christ, God, created all things. And notice the way the writer says this next phrase, he says, the things that he created 
were life. The ultimate in the creation of God is life. And then he says that this life is the light of the world. In other words, life, breath, what we all experience, this gift we have all been given, is the creation of God. And it's this life that lights up the entire world and all of humankind. And I think it's easy to say that, but to actually comprehend that, the fact that we have life, which is the creation of God, and this life is the light of all the world. Life is the light of all creation. The Word created all things, including life. And there's an indistinguishable connection between life and light. The light shined in the darkness. If you could imagine everything that was prior to creation, and I don't believe we have the capacity to do this, but let's make an attempt, then all you would have would be darkness, nothingness. But God created life, and the life was light, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness was not able to overcome it, and the light of the world, which created the life that we have, became that which predominates all of creation, and it's ours to experience. Now, Jesus in the incarnation is referred to as the light that enlightens everyone. And let's emphasize that word, everyone. Sometimes we get this notion that Christendom, the kingdom of Christianity, is a private club, only for those who are part of the in crowd. But everyone benefits from the life that Christ came to bring. You see, the writer says that the true light that was coming into the world enlightens everyone. Enlightens everyone. In other words, makes everything better. Brings things to our conscious awareness that were beyond our awareness previously. I believe that the writer, in talking about the light of Christ, enlightening everyone is referring to everything and everyone becoming better because of the presence of Christ in this world. I believe the incarnation just made everything better because the presence of Christ makes everything better. Now tell me, have you ever known someone one of your friends who just made life better by being present? Think of someone. Just being in their presence makes life better. Many of you are that to your friends and relatives. Just the fact that you're there makes life better for them. I know that sometimes when we're going through a hard time, when we're grieving, experiencing a loss, when we're experiencing very difficult times in our life, the presence of someone else there with you, just being there, just being present, very often offers support, help, and life. I know that you can think of those times, we all can. Just someone being there. The presence of someone brings life, makes the situation better. I believe 
that that was and is the presence of Christ for all of creation. I believe that the presence of Christ in creation made creation even better. I think that's what the author means when he said, Christ, the true light, enlightens everyone. Everyone benefits. Everyone benefits from the presence of Christ in the world. I think this is very apparent in the sociological evolution of all things in the direction of better because of the presence of God in the world and the lives and energies of God's people who own God's presence. Now, I know what you're looking at and I know what you're thinking about when I say things are getting better. We are so prone to looking at all that's bad in the world. And we decry the evils of our present existence. And understandably, there is a lot of evil in the world. There are a lot of bad things happening out there. And it's easy to identify those things and to emphasize how bad life is out there. However, I believe that we often forget that the world is God's creation. No matter how bad it gets, or how bad we try and make it, the world is God's world. And even when systemic forces beyond our control allow for bad things to happen, the world is still God's creation. And the people who populate the world are God's creation. I am not sure that God is about destroying the creation of God, as someone or as some would have us to believe, that it's all bad and God's going to destroy it and make it all new. Well, I believe that God is making it all new. And I believe that's what the writer meant when he said, Jesus is the light of the world who enlightens everyone. It's not a destroy and make it all better. It's a constantly making what is better over and over again. The message of the Bible, the New Testament in particular, is not about destruction. It's about redemption. In the New Testament reading this morning that I read to you earlier from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul wrote that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. The Christian experience is not about condemnation and destruction, but about life and redemption. Because of the presence of God in the world, and, I would suggest, because of the incarnation of God in the world, in the person of Jesus Christ, the direction of life has been toward that which is good. We are constantly moving in a better direction. I honestly believe that. An example of this would be that things that were considered normal and acceptable even 200 years ago, are now recognized as being detrimental to life itself. Now think about that. Some of the things that we experienced in our own nation 200 years ago, 100 years ago, things that were considered normal and acceptable are now seen in a new light and they're seen as being wrong and they're being put out of our lives, made illegal and are understood as being detrimental to everything good. Examples of this, abusive behaviors, which a few generations ago were considered normal, are now seen as being very detrimental to that which is good. Racist practices, which were the norm just a few generations ago, 
are now seeing it, seen as being very wrong and they've been made illegal and inappropriate. The normalizing of racist language and behaviors, the lack of equality in our world that, that we're trying to make better, the recognition of the need for equal opportunity in our world, for economic safety nets for the poor, the medical advancements that we've seen, the increase in life expectancy, the decrease in the need for physical pain, all of these things are better now than they were a few generations ago. Now to say that we are where we should be with each of these things would be a misnomer. Or to suggest that life is perfect would miss the entire point. However, the mere fact that we recognize some of these things as being societally problematic puts us far ahead of the days when they were considered a normal and acceptable practice in everyday life. For this reason, life is better now in many respects than it was. The world is better and has the potential of getting even better. And I believe this is all because of the presence of God in the world. And to take it one step further, I believe that it's because of the incarnation of God in the world, in the person of Jesus Christ. And the writer of the Gospel of John, when he used the phrase, enlightens everyone, he doesn't say everyone who does the right thing or lives the right life. He says everyone, even those who do not accept or believe in God, benefit from the presence of God in the world. Now, in the Gospel reading, it says that Jesus, the Word, God incarnate, went to his own people, and his own people did not know him. Sometimes it's difficult for us to recognize the presence of God in the world. I believe also that people who are caught up in this world system will often not even know the presence of Christ when that presence is in their midst. It is even possible for people to misrepresent things of God for things of this world and vice versa. People of God in the first century during the lifetime of Jesus did not recognize God when God was in their presence in the person of Christ. People will often be in the presence of Christ even today in our context and will not be able to recognize that he is there. Examples of this include being in a position to speak out for justice or live out justice and see it instead as a problem with which we need to contend. Being in the presence of a homeless person with an opportunity to give them something to help sustain their life, but instead considering it a drag on an otherwise good day. Or how about this, going through a crisis of faith in which things you have always believed are being challenged. And seeing that as a difficult time, which it is, and considering a time of torment, which it is, as opposed to being a time of spiritual growing and spiritual maturing. And on and on. I believe that just as the people of God failed to recognize Jesus as God in the first century, I believe that sometimes we are in the presence of God. We are sometimes in, a, in the presence of a situation that God has established for us. And we very often don't understand. We fail to recognize God. Now finally, both St. Paul in his writing to the Ephesians and the writer of the Gospel of John talk about grace and truth. You know, when these words were written 20 some odd centuries ago, the law had been part of the people of God for thousands of years. 
But now, both writers, Paul and John, are saying that the law is to be replaced by grace and truth. How many of you know that in order to live the Christian life, in order to experience the depths of spirituality, grace has to be present? And being successful in our Christian experience requires acceptance and ownership of God's grace in our lives and in our approach to and relationship with other people. The law was never able to successfully bring people to God. It is God's grace that not only brings people to God, but helps in living the life that God has called us to live. People of God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became human in the person of Jesus Christ. God dwelt among us. I believe it's important to understand and connect with God's presence in our lives. Christ is present in our lives, in our world, and in our context. Let's pray together. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you for the incarnation. Help us to understand it. More importantly, help us to live it out through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join me as together we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We're going to the Lord in prayer. And for those who are present with us here, as we pray, I invite you to think of things that you would like God to be aware of in your own life. Things that you would like us as a congregation to be praying about. I invite you to be familiar with and aware of those things and think about them as we together present those things to God, to a God who hears us, and who cares? Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we know that you care about us. We know that you have called us to be your people. And we know that in calling us to be your people, you have empowered us to live the life that you have called us to live. We thank you, Lord, that you became human. We thank you, Lord, that you experienced life just like we experience life. We thank you, Lord, that the power that you had to live it, we also have to live it. We ask, Lord, that you will help us to tap into that power. Help us to grow in our understanding of you. Help us to grow in our understanding of what it means to be your people. We pray for those who have needs among us in our congregation, in our community. We ask that you will meet those needs. We pray, Lord, that where healing is needed, that you'll bring healing. Where reconciliation is needed, that you'll bring reconciliation where people are going through crisis, whether it be of faith, of relationship, of, of existence, we, we pray that, that, Lord, you will help them to experience freedom from that crisis and help as they're going through it and victory and joy following. We thank you, Lord, for hearing us when we pray. We 
pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, people of God, I want you to know that God loves you. And there's not a thing you can do about it. Go out into the world in peace. Honor everyone. Rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. May the grace of God, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>